Thanks so much, Patrick. And a huge thank you to Eileen for agreeing to join us. I'm just absolutely delighted to be introducing her and can't wait to hear her talk. So for those who don't know, Eileen Boris is one of the world's leading experts in gender studies and labor history. She's edited eight field-changing collections on feminism, gender equity, and paid labor at home. She has another one in the works that's coming out soon. And she has written four major award-winning books which touch on gender work and the state. I'll just say a little bit about her latest book. It was published in 2019. It's entitled Making the Woman Worker, Precarious Labor and the Fight for Global Standards, 1919 to 2019 came out with Oxford University Press. And the book is a tour de force. It explores how female workers have been precarious workers throughout history, but at the same time, how over the past 100 years, they've waged a fight for the recognition of basic rights and for the expansion of global labor standards. Professor Boris doesn't only look at the better known fights within the so-called Western world, she also explores debates in the global South and she traces, for instance, the origins of the Homework Convention in 1996. A really important theme in her book is the question of universalism versus particularism. That is, whether activists at different moments stressed difference or equality between women and, women and men and between women in the global South and in the North and how these choices played out through the passage of legislation and through the creation and transformation of feminist movements themselves. I also wanted to mention quickly that Professor Boris's personal life intersects in powerful ways with the main topics that animate her many books. She got her PhD at Brown University where she was part of a collective that developed the university's first women's studies class, which I'm particularly appreciative for because I went to Brown as an undergrad and took that class years later. Um, she helped launch the film Union Maids, which I'm sure many audience have seen. And she's been part of many important leading activist and protest movements from the 1960s to today, including work with the Women's Committee of 100 for Welfare Justice in the midst of the welfare battles that in many senses are still ongoing. And she also worked with the Self-Employed Women's Association, which was founded in 1972, and which is actually something I'm looking at for my research right now. So I should talk to her about that. Um, <laughs> Professor Boris is part also of a research network on domestic work connected to the International Federation of Domestic Workers. She's active with the California Domestic Workers Coalition and Scholars for a New Deal for Higher Education. So she's a really inspirational scholar who's you know, personal and, and uh, academic work intersects in much the same way that her, her academic work is trying to unmake uh, an artificial boundary between public and private and explore work across that boundary. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, Professor Boris. Again, her talk today is entitled, My Workplace is My Home from Industrial Evil to the Remote Office. Wow. Uh, thank you, Juliana. Uh, it's always astounding when you hear how people describe you. It's humbling, actually. So um, I'm really uh, honored to be here uh, at the center named after two really foremost uh, sociologists, uh, uh, particularly the late um, Eric Owen Wright. Uh, and I may, I may freeze on you. Uh, there may be some uh, playback. Uh, and if that happens, uh, I may uh, stop my video. So, but my voice is more important than, you know, seeing my beauty or whatever uh, here today. Uh, I don't dare put on a, uh, a different kind of background because I will definitely freeze if I do that uh, today. So, uh, for Thursday, I will actually be on my laptop because I'll have to be someplace else in my house because uh, they're going to be doing uh, banging across the street. Uh, and there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, so I'm going to try to share my screen to begin. And if that doesn't work out, uh, Peter will uh, take over on that. Let's see if I can share screen. 
Uh, yes, I can. Let's see. We'll see. Uh, we'll see if this will work. Uh -huh. Okay, now I just have to um, start the, the uh, slide show. Um, okay, play from the start. Thank you for being patient. We've learned uh, just to begin, uh, October, by the way, is National Work and Family Month, something that uh, was passed in 2003, uh, uh, I believe. And it's dedicated to work family balance. And in a way it's very appropriate that I'm doing this talk uh, at this time. My home is, my workplace is my home. At a time when increasing numbers of people worldwide have moved home to work, estimated as 557 million workers or 17.4% of the countable labor force. This lecture historicizes the outsourcing of labor into dwelling. I'm tracing the regulation of home-based manufacturing and to a lesser extent, white collar, sometimes known as telework, now known as digital homework over the last century. And of course, these images before you uh, show the, the major forms of uh, home-based work as we think of it, uh, the garment manufacturing, uh, the uh, making of crafts uh, and the digital office. The home, I contend, has haunted the formation of global labor standards. It has stood as the space of family privacy, the realm of reproduction, where women's responsibility, that is cisgendered women uh, for most of the history, uh, women's responsibility for the quotient aspects of life and for life itself, distinguished her from the male breadwinner. For nearly a Do, century- um, Eileen. Eileen, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we don't see anything on the screen. Really? It says you are screen sharing. Right, but there, I see that as well, but there's nothing that appears. Oh, well. Eileen, how about, we revert, how about we revert to plan B and I'll share your slides and you can just let me know whenever you'd like to change them. Is that okay? Very strange. Okay. Sorry about that. It may be time for a new computer, even though this one's only three years old. Okay. What are you doing? No, uh, no, that's the wrong one. It's the other one. No, no, uh, Peter, it's the, it's the other, that's Thursday's lecture. Ah. I'm very sorry about that. Give me one second. Okay. Well, anyway, in terms of an introduction, as I was saying, um, for nearly a century, the International Labor Organization, the ILO, attacked the low wages, long hours, and unregulated conditions of outwork. Indirectly, though, sometimes including outwork in its conventions and other instruments, but more often allowing member states to exempt myriad forms of home-based labor from coverage. Beginning in 1919, when the ILO emerged out of the First World War, along with the League of Nations, until the 1970s, when global supply chains intensified the relocation of manufacturing to the global South, garment unionists and most labor feminists pushed for the elimination of homework. By the last decades of the 20th century, however, they increasingly called for regulation rather than the prohibition of home-based labor. As the body that establishes norms for the world of work, 
the ILO appeared as a venue to gain redress. So now you can see these images uh, of the uh, contemporary remote office where you have both halves of a dual breadwinner uh, household uh, at their computers and a child uh, engaged in their Lego play, it looks like. Uh, you also have uh, the garment manufacturing at home and uh, in the global south, definitely, uh, it's ambiguous whether the uh, Asian uh, woman where she's located, uh, you have uh, the production of, uh, in this case, uh, incense sticks. Uh, and with the digital homework, you have men as well as women uh, undertaking uh, the labor. So rather than a progress narrative today, this is a tale of return with a twist. And those of you who've read Claire Hemmings, uh, the uh, British gender theorist recognize um, giving homage to her by uh, talking about uh, progress and return narratives. From outwork as an evil to be eradicated to home-based work and home workers as deserving decent work like all other laborers. But of course this happens at a time when the standard labor regime has unraveled. So we have a return to home workplaces with the gig economy intensified by the pandemic. The conditions of home-based labor have depended on the very inequalities between genders and geographies that made homework seem like the best of a set of bad deals for combining earning and caring. A deal that exemplifies cultural studies critic Lauren Berlant's concept of cruel optimism. The pandemic has revealed the limits of the home as a place of employment, even as this arrangement gestures to a new world of work. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give a brief discussion of the return to remote work. And then I'm gonna look at homework conditions in the past interwoven uh, somewhat with the present and then consider the battle for regulation under the ILO as a case study. Okay, uh, next image. Next slide. Mothers are the shock absorbers of, our, oh, now we wanna go back one. <laughs> yeah, oh, great, thanks, Peter. Mothers are the shock absorbers of our society. Pandemic imperils promotions for women academia. Women are not okay. Headlines such as these highlight the impact of remote learning and working on the health, welfare, and work life of those who disproportionately still care for dependents across the generation. Cisgendered women, whether or not in heteronormative households, tending to children, elders, and others who require aid and undertaking the labor of daily renewal. Those who must combine earning and caring in the same space are among those who have been born the brunt of COVID times, and particularly, of course, essential workers. Uh, we need to listen to, to earlier generations who claim my home is my workplace to see the flexibility has meant a stretch out of the working day. A flow and mixture when domesticity and domestic space merge with income generation. Scattered if not isolated, out workers, remote workers stand before their employers more alone than those gathered into the same workspace. The violence of work could bleed into domestic violence and the Hellebrunn School of Public Health in their women's uh, newsletter uh, during the pandemic has really traced worldwide the increase in domestic violence as people have been working at home. The conditions of labor, ventilation, light, heat, workspace, depended on the conditions of housing. And the worker in most cases paid what were fixed costs of production for the tools, power, and the very building. That is, while some employers and contractors gave supplies and machines, whether for sewing or computing, 
Others have expected the worker to pay up front or actually deducted from materials. No wonder in the second quote I have uh, on this slide by journalist Suzanne Moore, she could fume in 2020. And I quote her, this inflexibility is then somehow sold as flexibility, but assumes the worker is always prim for contact. The remote worker is for some companies, the ideal worker. They don't need a desk or expensive office space. They don't need a union. They are malleable and compliant at a time when we're all concerned with job losses to come. They may not be quite as productive, but they are doing enough to make big companies think this is the future. Uh, so on one hand, it can be a godsend as uh, Vox points out in the top quote, uh, for people who have to keep, whose children were at home uh, and want to keep safe during the pandemic, but, but it has exacerbated gender inequality. Next slide. And you could uh, click it again and uh, another image will come in. Okay. Given the difficulty of working class women's lives in the past as well as the present, including numerous pregnancies, childbirth, childminding, and heavy household labor, industrial homework, and now clerical and digital home labor appeared, as I said, the best of a set of bad options, allowing women to fulfill both reproductive and productive goals. Wage labor at home shared the invisibility of housework. Homework, the taking in to the dwelling place of the family items such as garments to sew, or cigars to roll, or envelopes to type, or coils to wind, belong to a larger gendered structuring of employment. Employers structured work to take advantage of sexual divisions and gender ideologies. They drew upon women's position as mothers to shift the burdens of production onto the worker whose payment by the piece encouraged exploitation called sweating. Employers increased profits by saving, as I've suggested already on overhead and gaining flexibility through having fewer full-time workers. Without other opportunities to fulfill all their duties, mothers turn to homework. And of course, it's not all mothers. We do have racialized uh, divisions of labor, even within homework. So uh, historically in the US, there were very fewer black women doing industrial homework, though they would be taking in washing, for example, in the uh, South in the um, 1890s where in nine, early 20th century, precisely when Lewis Hine captured this Italian family making artificial flowers in uh, one of these uh, images in, in the slide. Now, most homeworkers have perceived of their labor as flexible compared to the factory bell or the office clock, clock it was, but they could not truly control when they would labor. The work was irregular given to meet the employer's needs, not the rhythms of family life. Garmin outwork reflected the seasons of the industry. Telework as well as other forms of manufacturing has depended on the timing of orders. Digital putting out, such as Amazon's Mechanical Turks, is a constant hustle to bid for jobs. As such, home workers resembled other wage earning mothers whose working days stretched out between paid labor and family labor. But the home worker experienced all her work in the same space. Children meant interrupted labor. Wage labor in the home meant neglected family labor. As Mexican American women in the early 1930s in the US, who went, one who went to her mother's in law's house to sew on a machine, reported, and this is a very typical report, uh, she works very brokenly when the babies are awake and complained that she had no leisure for housework. As a Rhode Island lace maker explained, women who tell they can pull many bands a day don't tell truth. Those who pull many must let their housework go. With housework as her first priority, she began to pull after dinner, frequently works until late at night. And these quotes are taken from the original schedules uh, that the Women's and Children's Bureau uh, investigators uh, compiled in the 1920s and 30s. Over 40 years later, Maria Mies, uh, 
the German uh, Marxist feminists who went to India, uh, reported on the on lace makers. Uh, this is in 1980s uh, Nasipur, undertaken between morning and evening, cooking and resumed by um, oil lamp. Their crocheting became naturalized, even as male merchants and middlemen came to control a vast putting out system. Uh, could I uh, have the next uh, image? So what, be, uh, what seemed like a pastime had become a necessity for poorer families. And you could click again and uh, another slide will come in. Uh, I mean, another photo, yeah. Meanwhile, in the US, in the late 80, 1980s, immigrant garment workers testified as one Salvadorian in Los Angeles, as you see pictured here, told of the desire to save on childcare expenses, and that motivated her turning to homework. But it hadn't worked out. Journalists reported home typists who discovered it didn't take long be before things began to unravel. The children were at her elbow every moment. Uh, demanding a tissue or a cookie or fighting with each other. The phone would ring or someone would be at the door and usually the day ended in full-blown chaos. And I predict my, one of our phones will ring during the middle of this talk. Uh, the image from across the board, of course, is an idealized image of a hard day at the office. And, and, and I've argued uh, in previous work that that kind of uh, representation of the home office and homework actually uh, rationalized the, uh, the garment outwork that immigrant women of color found themselves uh, doing uh, even in the uh, 1980s and into the present. Okay, I'll take the next slide, thank you. Now homework long appeared as a social problem in the minds of reformers who feared disease, dirt, and the degradation of motherhood and child life. Women were mostly homeworkers in the Anglo-American world, and even in, um, in France, for example, uh, and reformers who also were predominantly women adhered to a feminism of difference. They tended to reject paid labor in the name of improving the lives of women, strained to, as one put it, the limit of human endurance by bearing, nursing, and taking care of children, and at the very same time in place trying to earn a wage. The family wage could improve the lives of such women, but not all women could depend on men. So they championed living wages, equal pay for equal work, training, and the organization of women. Because homeworkers, like women in industry as a whole, were in lesser skilled, labor abundant, and difficult to organize sectors, Reformers sought to have the women who spends influence the labor condition of the woman who works. They organized consumer protests, the National Consumers League came out of this, and turned to labor legislation to facilitate and complement uh, union organizing. In short, reformers responded to the presence of homework by trying to prohibit it or impose regulations that would be so burdensome that employers would stop sending work into homes. They did not provide child and dependent care services so home workers could take other employment. Rather, they tried to provide other sources of income while keeping the mother home, including mother's pensions for the worthy widow. Policies for the home and workplace, in this case, interconnected. To free the home from the invasion of the factory, so to speak, but to main the separation, maintain the separation of between home and work. So these images, we have the sweaters, Sweated Industries exhibit from uh, London. Uh, the exact date of that is skipping my head, but it was, it was in the early 20th century. And then uh, a uh, poster put together by the National Child Labor Committee uh, with Lewis Hine, the great documentarian photographs, homework destroys family life, uh, and at the bottom, would you like your child to grow up here or there? So the ideal child with her mother and her dolly and, and the piano and then the wreck of the home kind of notion. Okay, I'll uh, take the next image. Okay, so 
historically the debate became regulation versus prohibition. And the arguments were that it was impossible to monitor work at home, you needed too many inspectors, thus suppression was the only alternative. Uh, it was also, uh, we have uh, impossibility because of fear of uh, state control over private life. And I'm gonna stop my video um, for a moment and see whether um, uh, keeping it off for a minute, you'll, you'll get me in real time when I put it back on. Uh, also the notion of labor inspectors, uh, as one French uh, later, uh, French delegate to the ILO said in 1947, so this is almost half century later, the labor inspectors abode from inspecting the home workers actual place of work by the principle of you know, the inviolability of private domicile, which French social legislation has apparently not modified to any extent. Um, we have the 1915 articles uh, about minimum wages for workers in the home, but how do you enforce? If the experience of homework merged mothering and wage uh, earning, both employer decisions and state policy reinforced the opposition of mother and worker. Early 20th century labor legislation uh, rarely included manufacturing the home, and when it did, it was rarely enforced. This lack of coverage encouraged employers to send work home extending the workday despite laws on hours. Since homework was piecework, employers could maneuver around wage laws. And because homework was in the home, who would monitor the other working uh, conditions? Let's see if my video will get back on. So it was easy to uh, hide the child worker by the time the inspector reached the front door, uh, homes were private spaces, it was argued, not liable to public or state intrusion. The state's major contribution to the increase of homework came ironically from the very labor laws passed to protect women and children, which define women as mothers rather than workers and fail to cover men, at least in the US, because of constitutional interpretations of the right to work and due process. Let's have the next slide which is the problem of the home. And the two quotations here, uh, and there's another image, uh, come from 1919 in the very first I, uh, International Labor Conference. And this really um, shows the attitudes uh, that, you know, oh, a father wouldn't exploit his own children, the Greek delegate said, uh, and, on the other hand, um, the French labor delegate chimed in that uh, this is shameful exploitation that we should take action. The unionists and women reformers alike betrayed the home worker as isolated. But these women performed their labor within a very rich nexus of kinship and community. Whole neighborhoods would make flowers, pins, or pants. So, the public and private really, or the social and community and the home really were interconnected. And yet the way in which policymakers, trade unionists, reformers, and ultimately the law referred to them, it was this family has a real home, this home has become a factory. Or the notion is the man is a slacker. But when I went, this image, uh, the top image is a Lewis Hine photograph, that when I went to the Library of Congress and looked at the index card that Hine had put about the image, because he had one, uh, his notes for all of his uh, photographs in the tenement house photographs, uh, there was a description that the father was a railroad man and he was injured. So it wasn't that he was being a slacker and just you know, rocking in his chair, while his children and wife uh, did their um, industrial homework. Rather, he was incapacitated. And this was a time before worker compensation uh, generalized or uh, before pensions. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll have the next um, image. 
At this point, I want to remind you about the ILO. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, those of us who are uh, ILO scholars kind of think, well, no one thinks the ILO is important. And it might not be as important as, say, the World Bank today. Uh, but it is, I find it a good arena to think with. And we might talk about that if you're interested. Well, the ILO was founded in the aftermath of World War I by the social democratic but colonial victors as an alternative to Bolshevism. It has addressed the world of work as a norm setting body through a unique tripartite structure representing states, organized workers and employer associations. It has brought together delegates to pass treaty like conventions which are aspirational counterweights to the vicissitudes of the market. Member states were to ratify and implement the conventions uh, through heightened uh, national labor standards. The ILO's basic components, the International Labor Office, which I refer to as the office, under an elected director general, the governing body, and the annual International Labor Conference have remained even as its uh, components within the office have varied over the century. These branches, a global bureaucracy of researchers and civil servants have generated knowledge about working conditions, legal regime, social provision, and economic conditions, creating the very statistics and facts available to policymakers and scholars alike. They have characterized the woman worker rather than offering a space for laboring women to define themselves. Although in the last decades, some within have set about to do just that, to provide an arena for informal domestic and other low wage women to demand recognition and rights. That is the ILO discussed mostly spaces of labor dominated by men for most of its history, like factories and ships, only since the 1970s did it focus on the informal sector and the home workplace. Okay, next image. And so over the course of the century, if we look at uh, the ILO and home-based labor, we see a shift from an evil practice to coverage under the ILO's rubric of decent work. That means the standard labor contract uh, under labor standards. Uh, and I really divide this into a number of ships during the interwar years of 1919 to 1939, uh, the ILO allowed for the exemption of outworkers in conventions still seen as an evil practice. They would just went there often. And other times they were just exempted. And the early post-war well, two years, the, the action against industrial homework is stalled, but home handicraft uh, in the ILO imaginary becomes the fit work for women in Asia and other so-called developing areas. Then we see parallel movements for action. Uh, the international trade unions uh, and ILO tripartite committees in the clothing sector in particular that were made up of unionist governments and employers. We see them discussing what to do between 1960s and the 1980s. And then there becomes a parallel movement for action uh, among what I dubbed the ILO feminist development experts and the women campaigners. Uh, when I first began doing uh, this work, I thought it was only the women campaigners that were important because I was involved with them uh, early on uh, in, the, well, in the late 80s and the early 90s. But as I did my research, I realized that the, if it wasn't for the trade unions, even the male dominated ones, uh, there would have never been a home-based uh, labor convention because of the power of uh, trade unions in this tripartite uh, organization. And we see over time then a shift of the discourse from industrial homework or outwork to looking at home-based labor, which was the preferred term of uh, women and others in the global South who talked about own account workers, who talked about their, the notion of independent contractors 
under informal economies was a little different than looking at uh, independent contractors as a ruse to get around the labor law, which develops in the global north with co uh, contracting and industrial homework. And then finally, we see a return of the sweatshop, the gig economy and digital homework. Okay, I'll take the um, next slide. Okay, so this is just to uh, remind you during the interwar years, there was a global uh, women's movement. The National Federation of Working Women asked the ILO in 1923 to research the condition in which home workers of both sexes are working in all nations and to secure extension of suitable legislation to countries without it. But they recognized that homework was a difficult subject from the trade union point of view. And the image uh, below is of the first uh, International Congress of Working Women in which uh, took place right before the first ILO International Labor uh, uh, con conference in 1919. And this, for many reasons, this organization didn't uh, uh, ex uh, fell apart by the mid uh, uh, 1920s. But its legacy reminds us that uh, women trade unionists had a more complicated understanding of uh, industrial homework than some of their male counterparts. Uh, next image. The, it is the minimum wage fixing convention of 1928 that we see the most movement in terms of home-based labor. Uh, in, in theory, this was a gender neutral convention. It talked about um, those occupations that workers were unorganized, that uh, they uh, suffered from outwork in, in the terms of those days. And the idea, according to the Norwegian government uh, delegate, Betsy Jalsberg, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, who had been in the 1919 uh, women's uh, uh, meeting, it was not to repress homework, but rather to fix its wages in light of actual conditions, to cover the cost of living and enable the worker to maintain, she said, his working capacity. And she defended the compatibility of wage fixing with the principle that workers have a right to a living wage as well as an equal one. So, you, so it could be done through unions, but it also could be done through the wage board. Uh, here we have an argument for legal equality between the sexes, but the, you, you still find in the 1920 activist women in the labor movement and elsewhere, uh, claiming that it's their duty as women to defend these principles. So equality, but female difference. I'll take the uh, next image. The argument really uh, one, was one of uh, special treatment or equal treatment. How do you deal with labor in the home? Uh, should wage boards only be for homework or for all trades? The employers, which wanted to restrict to just homework, uh, which was very difficult to enforce. And they didn't want the inclusion of workers located in other spaces like factories, because that really challenged their prerogative to set wages. But the actual convention re didn't refer to just homework. Then there were others like a South African delegate, a white South African delegate, from the Department of Labor said to deal with this uh, homework as a system of evasion means uh, you have to place the same kind of work carried out in factories in the homes on a similar footing. But really this delegate argued, why don't we just abolish the practice and establish daycare for it to facilitate mothers going out to work? So, these are the, some of the parameters that uh, persist in kinds of debate. 
tests uh, on um, homework. Let's uh, go to the next image. Because even during 1928 debate, where it is homework is understood as women's work, the work of a family, the work, the French delegate says the work is exceptional because of the special category of the workers employed. So the emphasis is not on the characteristics of the work, but the characteristics of the worker. Social conditions that women find themselves in, that is being involved with the care and maintenance of children and the maintenance of the household. A uh, Berlin women's home workers trade unionist from Germany, a German uh, worker advisor in 1928 argued that these women, uh, you know, their welfare and the welfare of their children depend upon getting adequate wages. And so she hoped that the question would never come down to giving the workers and particularly the women workers a choice between having very low wages and having no wages at all. So among some trade unionists, there was a pushback uh, against the notion of abolishing work in the home. The argument was, let's really enforce labor standards in the home. Because, but of course, employers uh, went to homework because it was cheaper. Next slide. I'm just, I just wanna emphasize uh, one point uh, these are a number of the um, conventions that they do include out workers, but as an asterisk, um, they're not really, uh, there's no real enforcement, et cetera, with them. And it's fascinating though, with the holidays with pay uh, convention, that uh, home-based workers are classified with domestic workers as impossible to regulate. The governing body of the ILO is asked to consider the present lack of any regulation of the hours of work of these workers as a justification for paid holidays. But at the, uh, at the other time, and it's pointed to the special character of the relations between employers and home workers would lead to, you have to have special arrangements. So this is also a persistent thread. Next image. In the early post-World War II years, uh, labor feminists in and outside of the ILO, uh, here's Mildred uh, Fairchild, who is head of their, uh, from the US originally, uh, who is head of the uh, Office on Women and Children, uh, are arguing for investigation and action, that there is a belief, according to the Correspondent Committee on Women's Work, that homework is going to be increasing. And the US government is really concerned about stopping the deterioration of the standards obtained during the war year. So homework is always seen uh, by the US government as something that undermines uh, wage structures and occupations uh, traditionally associated with women. And so homework remains part of the problems of the employment of mothers of families. They send out a questionnaire to governments about what do you think of this issue? What are your laws? Uh, and they get very few questions and very few answers. But throughout you see these tropes of irregularity, danger, illegality, illegitimacy. And so the men uh, in control of the ILO, like Jeff Renz, who uh, is uh, not facing forward, men not facing forward, who's from uh, a labor uh, uh, from uh, Belgium, who is an assistant uh, uh, general director, uh, says, well, it's just premature for us to really do anything on uh, home-based uh, work on industrial home. And this persists into the, uh, for decades. Let's go to the next image. At the other, uh, on the other hand, it, there is a push 
to bring to train women in handicraft. Uh, but is handicraft just another form of exploitative homework? And that is a discussion uh, that goes on both in the uh, ILO and other uh, global entities like the uh, United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, Frida Miller, who, had, who was head of the US Women's Bureau, becomes head under Truman, uh, does, uh, is very active in the ILO. And she talks about goods produced by independent artisans and self-employed people resemble those of homework, but are not exactly the same thing. And we should encourage the craft work, but realize how difficult that could be. Uh, there was a recognition, this is uh, Asian difference, you might argue, uh, those are the discussions over and over again about how Asia's small scale and cottage industries are related to capital shortage. Uh, so you really have to uh, promote best practices within home-based labor. Uh, and so even Frida Miller, who is campaigns against the sweatshop and against industrial homework in the US, is emphasizing uh, the difference between Asian handicraft and industrial homework, which he sees as a parasitic growth on the established factory system. Okay, next um, slide. Whereas homework could appear to home workers as an economic strategy, even a preferred one, it became an economic threat to trade unionists. Organized labor feared the undercutting of wages, hours, and working conditions of factory laborers. And uh, what we, I'm gonna be quick uh, because I see um, we're about at time, uh, but we had a little bit of delay at the beginning, uh, that we see uh, the global, garment workers unions uniting into one uh, international textile garment and leather workers federation, which is really because of their weakness, uh, the loss of membership in Europe and the United States with the problem of offshoring and outsourcing, which didn't begin in the 1970s, but really uh, intensified right after World War II. And, and the challenge for the trade unions was to uh, organize workers uh, in the global south, but maintain their own uh, unions. And that meant leveling the playing field. It meant uh, getting uh, regulation of unfair practices in which the putting out system uh, to uh, maneuver around wages and hours and such was central. And throughout their discussions, there's these discourses going back to the late 19th century of disgust and outrage of evil and pity and coercion metaphors, uh, referring to slave labor and near slavery and people chains, et cetera. And there's a request of their affiliates to press their governments to pursue policies leading to the ultimate abolition. And yet um, th there was also a recognized you can't do away with it right away. It was going to undermine the industry in certain countries. Okay, next image. Beginning in the 1960s, you have a number of these tripartite meetings of the clothing industry. The, uh, there's discussions, there's research, there's resolutions. At first, um, it's, it's still the evil, but it has to remain for those, for example, so-called physically handicapped persons who cannot adapt themselves to factory labor. Although I should add that um, the, the Soviet Union includes mothers with children in that category uh, at this time. By the time you get to the second uh, club meeting, uh, it's pretty explicit, banning and covering. By then, the employers won't agree to anything. They say, why didn't we even agree in 1964 that it was a problem? It's, it's, it's a way of doing business. 
by the third tripartite meeting in 1987, uh, there is a, uh, the, the ask is for a comprehensive study, but also to convene a tripartite meeting of experts on homework as soon as possible as a first step towards having a convention. Why does that happen? You have the push from the trade unions, but and I have the next image. You also have um, at this at this time um, a um, a movement of um, women pushing to both consider the consequences of and uh, reform what they call a new putting out system. Uh, the heroines, if there are any in my book, are the those involved with the program on rural women, which are feminist staff within the ILO that shared a broader understanding of home-based labor. Uh, and they commissioned research from uh, about rural women in the global south undertaken by researchers from the region and also uh, women activists and activist groups. And they partnered with rural women's organizations in many places in Asia and particularly, particularly the Self-Employed Women's Association of Gurjarat. And here we have an image of Gurjarat. And two of the women involved in this group are, were um, Martha uh, Lafi and Bia uh, Ahmed. Uh, they push from within and they get uh, studies done and and resolutions are happening. Uh, and this, so, so you get multiple fronts in which there is a uh, movement uh, in, within the institution and without that home-based work needs to become decent work. Let's have the next image. Uh, this is um, uh, Seva organizing for below. Uh, this was, I found this in a report by one of the ILO uh, experts uh, from their India office, a woman from Finland, who went to what these, these camps that women would be brought together and they would learn about their rights. And it was very much participatory uh, action uh, within the women and they were uh, engaged in role playing and uh, really uh, learning how to mobilize on the ground. Next, next image. At the same time that the program Rural Women wa was um, funding and giving technical support to groups like SAWAR, they were had instituted a new line of research. And I just want to uh, point out that Maria Mises' work first we had a different title as a report of the ILO and then the ILO partnered uh, for its publication it was funded by the ILO. Uh, and it was that work that really convinced people uh, that within uh, the um, research division of the ILO that it was really, this was really an issue to, to consider that they weren't just housewives producing for the world market, but that, um, that this was a uh, common practice that could be regulated. And the, one of the ways the ILO does things is uh, it creates these studies and these condition of work digests. And one happened in 1989 on homework. And then there was one on telework because there was some uh, research and concern uh, the futurists at that time thought uh, we were going to all be working from the remote office. I could talk about that later. Let's have um, next image. How did it become an agenda item? There was support from various trade union, international uh, trade union federations, uh, the British and Dutch unions, the women campaigners within the unions and without. Uh, there was the impact of direct appeals. Ella Bott of Sewa, who had uh, come from a Gandhian family, she was a lawyer. She uh, was uh, head of the women's division of the trade union uh, group, uh, labor association 
in um, India. Uh, she gets kicked out, and Sewa gets kicked out because uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. They're not considered enough of a real trade union because they're doing cooperatives and other things, but it was also a power struggle. Uh, when the ILO's uh, then director, Francois uh, Blanchard, goes and he meets with her, she directly and uh, appeals to him. He comes back, how impressed he is. He writes to the uh, head of the international uh, um, trade unions. And uh, there's a lot of union resolutions in this time. Some of it uh, maneuvered between El Abad and uh, Dan Gallen of the International Union of Food, Tobacco, et cetera, et cetera, workers, because Sewar gets to join that because they're organizing us. Uh, BD makers. Next image. So the homework convention is passed in 1996. The employers try to delay it. They all walk out at one point. They, none of them vote for it, but enough governments vote with labor for it. And it puts homeworkers under whatever the labor standards are. But what if there aren't any labor standards? This becomes you know, the problem. What if there isn't social security protection? What if there isn't maternity protection for other workers? Uh, th there's very few countries sign on to this um, convention. In fact, only 10. But it paved the way for reorganizing uh, the home and for recognizing, I should say, the home is a workplace and the domestic worker convention uh, that I'll talk about on Thursday couldn't have happened without this convention. Okay, I'm going to uh, finish with just a few more slides about the new organizing. Okay. And I have a couple of images there. Uh, but at this, oh, we, can we go back one? Okay. So at the same time this is happening at the ILO, one reason it can happen at the ILO is because of movement on the ground. By the late 1980s, Union spokeswomen asserted that homework was not a form of daycare. Trade unions began to shift their discourse, recognizing that it belonged to a larger economic restructuring, which consisted of the offshore production and part-time and contingent work. That such changes were creating a more marginal labor force and undermining welfare states in which entitlements like social security and healthcare benefits were tied to employment. Homework then was another attack on the whole welfare state. And unions also changed with women's increased labor force participation, reflecting the rise of the new feminism. Uh, the, you, at the end of the 1990s, you really have a new sweatshop, anti-sweatshop movement that is both encouraged by the ILO convention, but coming out of the same forces. Uh, so here we have a march uh, in price photo uh, sweatshop watch in 2003. Uh, the old Unite uh, had a consumer guide to decent clothes. It's the old strategy of appealing to the consumer, but also a mobilization of women uh, coming out of the ILO convention, a development of home net uh, that then um, dies for a while, but now is resurrected. Uh, where these are women from Nepal are marching during International Women's Day in which they want equal wages for women home-based workers. And they want their government to ratify the ILO convention. Okay, next, next image. So my last two images are come out of my feeling that we are all home workers now that the standard labor contract between employers and employees has significantly unraveled, that wage theft has become an acceptable business practice that was so much prevalent with industrial homework, that hours don't count, only the job completed. The burden of production is placed on so-called independent contractors and other own account workers, as social protection is narrowed, and I'm wondering, does the University of Wisconsin pay for your extra you know, internet or your um, electricity bill or anything? Uh, University of California, Santa Barbara doesn't pay for my um, working at home when I have. 
Um, the final image is the new world of, of uh, homework, of the one that uh, just last winter was released, um, new study working from home. From, uh, and uh, in 2019, before COVID, there were a million home-based workers uh, worldwide, the majority women, according to this uh, study. Uh, the, in it, the ILO reiterates a century long reframe. They are usually worse off than those who work outside the home, even in higher skilled professions. Homeworkers earn an average of 13% less in the United Kingdom, 22% less in the United States of America, 25% less in South Africa, and about 50% less in Argentina, India, and Mexico. Homeworkers also face greater safety and health risks and have less access to training than non-home-based workers, which can affect their career prospects. Well, with my home is my workplace, more than ever, we must insist that home-based workers are indeed workers and part of the labor force, not merely mothers undermining the real workers who labor in shops, offices, and factories and fields. We are left with the persistence of the home sweatshop, but also the promise of remote work. Telework and outsourcing clerical and white collar labor so feared in the late 1980s and early 1990s did not materialize until COVID-19 arrived to turn the world upside down or perhaps more fitting. Out the outside came home. Thank you. Well, that was excellent. Um, so we have now time approximately 20 minutes for questions and answers. And a number of you are probably very familiar with this procedure, but I'll nonetheless go over it, which is that there are two ways that you can raise questions or make comments. One of which is that if you go to the bottom of your, or they're both at the bottom of your screen in the menu there, at the far right, you'll see this one that says reactions. You can in, uh, alert me that you'd like to ask a question by raising your hand there. The other option, third from the left, is the chat. If you're less inclined to hear your voice or have others hear your voice, you can write it and then be forced to hear my voice as I read out your question. So those are the two um, options. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of at a time, just in the interest of the remaining time that we've got. So the queue is open. Um, and Gay Seidman has raised her hand. Go ahead, Gay. I want to Hi, ask Lee. you to un. Hi, Gay. How are you? Um, so it was another great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask a question that I, I love the talk. Let me be clear. But I want to ask a question that I have been asked. Um, Nyla Kabir has given me a very hard time for pushing for um, minimum wages globally. And I guess I, my view of minimum wages has been shaped by your work. So I'm blaming you a little for this because um, I think they're a good thing. Um, but she argued forcefully that um, poor families would have fewer income options if their workplaces were actually, if the home workplace was actually regulated and wages were higher, there'd be, and, and I actually, I totally disagree with her, but I didn't have a good answer. So I wondered what I, what should I have said? All right. Um, so Nan Enstad also would like to ask a question and go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Um, hi, hi, Lene. <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, wonderful talk. I'm so, uh, it's so great to hear this work and I learned a ton and it was just um, so interesting because just last week, because of Zoom, <laughs> I had this guy who worked for the ILO into my labor and global food systems class to talk about his work for the ILO working with farm workers. And he just said exactly, he put all the conventions up, you know, and he said exactly what you said. It's just this, he's like, it's this endless problem that affects farm workers as well, right? Is that the, that the domicile is an inviolable, you know, inviolable <laughs> space that you can't go in and regulate. So if, if, if it's one thing, if it's, you know, 
um, Del Monte that's hiring, you know, hiring farm workers. But if it's a if it's a small farmer that lives on site and on, and hires 25 farmers, male and female, then you can't regulate it or it's really difficult to regulate it. So I wonder, I mean, this is just sort of like what how do you how can we leverage because he didn't talk, he did talk about that this is a problem with domestic workers too. He he did talk about gender, but he didn't say there's been people working on this for a hundred years, right? And what what can we bring to this? How can we like marshal some of this wisdom that's come out of this? And I really appreciate the progress that you're saying has actually been made to make it even an issue and to that qualifies for decent work. But I'm wondering like what. It's not a very historian question to be asking you like what we should do now, but <laughs> I'm gonna ask you anyway. All right, there you go. Two questions and other people can think about questions they'd like to ask in the meantime. Well, sorry for going a little over, but with the technical problems at the beginning, I think I was not too much over. Um, okay, what good questions? And of course to a historian, right? But okay. What poor families would have, look, we always get that argument, uh, exploitation, we have to live with it because they're starving. But it isn't a dichotomy between poor wages and no wages. And we understand that when we look at collective action. When, and it's really connected to the implementation because where people are organized, they can make a difference. You know, labor standards never work just because they're in a book. There's never enough inspectors to come into every home or every workplace. But what there are, are organized groups of trade unions, of worker associations, or of NGOs of some kind. Uh, you know, I think of the National Consumers League under Florence Kelly, as a, a, the early 20th century, as a form of the NGO of that day. Now, National Consumers League has gotten in some trouble lately, but um, I can't remember the entire, entire tr trouble. But um, uh, then when I think of, uh, you know, say where I was organizing the women. So, and they got the Indian government to recognize that these workers came under the minimum wage. And if the workers have an organization of an individual behind their back, the individual worker doesn't go to the contractor. It's the organization that puts the pressure. So that's why I see this as really a false dichotomy. And really um, Gay's question and Nan's question are really interconnected then. Um, how do we get into the home? Uh, it was, it, it, it is a real problem. And I'm going to talk about that with domestic workers on Thursday, but it really is, uh, it is education it is recognizing that this isn't invisible work, but it's, it's also through collective action, uh, that, that does it. Uh, there was a very clever uh, solution in Uruguay when uh, they developed their tripartite uh, system uh, uh, for uh, domestic work. And if there was a complaint in a neighborhood, it, every house in the neighborhood would be notified so that the individual worker, domestic worker in an individual house would not necessarily be signaled out and that the inspector would go to every house. Now houses could not let them in at, at the first space, but it was a way to move beyond individual liability, individual exposure. To, so that's, that's one thing, but it's always been a conundrum how, how you regulate the home. And we really, that's our job, I think, as uh, activist scholars and as public intellectuals to, to point out that the home is not private. It's the state is there all the time. 
And why do we allow the social worker to come in with child abuse, but not with economic abuse in the home? I could go on and on, but you know, I see that. All April right. Raised hand. Okay, so April Haynes has a question. And, um, and if anybody else would like to ask one, please queue up. And April, we're gonna ask you to, un there you go. April. Hi. It's so good to see you. Hi, Eileen. <laughs> it's good to see you too. Thanks so much for the talk. Um, it's really interesting. And I always learn so much from listening to you. Um, and one thing that you said, um, I'm sorry, can you see me? Yeah. My video, I'm getting an alert that I can, oh, okay. Um, so one thing that you said really stuck out um, early on in the talk, which is about the racialization of home manufacturing versus laundry um, and I presume other forms of household labor. Well, I, I don't wanna predict everything you're going to say on Thursday, but I'm wondering, what do you think the origins of that racialization um, are and how rigid, I mean, this is kind of where I'm going with the question, how rigid is that division or how permeable has it been historic, historically? Um, and it sort of was triggering thoughts um, as you were talking about the discourse of motherhood you know, they're merely mothers when they're European and European immigrant women. Um, and then sort of the way in which black motherhood has been racialized and devalued. So I just wonder what you think about, um, about that division. So we don't have any other questions currently. When you wanna tackle that one while others- yeah, that's, um... that's a great question. You know, first I'm, I'm gonna indirectly answer that because when I, as someone who helped coin the phrase, maybe I did coin it, the racialized gendered state, uh, I, uh, when I was working on with the ILO materials, I kept on saying, oh my God, you know, I'm a historian of the racialized gendered state in the US. How does my understanding of race map on to the globe? You know, does it map on? Can it map on? Uh, what happens? And of course, it didn't map on quite the same way, but I went to colonialism uh, and I got to uh, look at that uh, in, in, in ways, but also the, there's a global racialized division of labor. Uh, so that's just an aside perhaps, but you do see uh, people from despised castes and uh, ethnic groups uh, doing the dirty work, doing the worst work uh, in other places as well. But to get to uh, April's specific question in terms of uh, racialization, uh, in terms of uh, black uh, women, uh, native women, et cetera, uh, in, the, uh, in the US, it's fascinating that uh, home outwork is, is associated not with the South. Although we know there's home manufacturing under um, racial slavery. And we know that labor takes place in the home. Uh, but black motherhood, black women were supposed to be workers, right? The mules of the world, nor, uh, you know, as the first thing put it, uh, they were workers, not mothers. And black motherhood has not, as we know, uh, been uh, venerated. The, with industrial work, there were some black women who did uh, homework. Uh, I did a piece many years ago on uh, black women doing homework in Chicago, actually. And there were some doing garment work in New York uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, but by and law, and the black women in Chicago were doing lampshade making at home. Uh, but by and large, it seems in the racialized gender division of labor uh, that it was immigrant women uh, from uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, Southern Europeans, but also from Asia and from uh, later, and from the Americans, Americas uh, that did this kind of work. Uh, so that is uh, pretty fascinating. You have a lot of um, industrial homework in uh, Texas, 
by the 1930s uh, with Mexican women doing that. Uh, but, I, but I do think it's so enmeshed in that larger history. Now, when it comes to uh, indigenous women, uh, there the question of handicraft versus uh, homework fits in. And I haven't studied that, studied that closely. And I hope somebody does, if you do know of someone who has studied that really closely. I, I know in the so-called arts and crafts era, you know, my first book was on um, art and labor. Uh, and that's why when I got to the, um, on the arts and crafts movement and the influence of John Ruskin and William Morris in the US. And that's why when I began doing the ILO work, I could, I, I could get into it first through looking at handicraft and outwork because I'd already written you know, books on that, knew, had a feel for that. Uh, you did have all these projects that were incredibly exploitative on reservations. And so, and, but, but again, we're at um, Keber's uh, notion, well, was it exploitation of native women or could they use that as one of their in, one of their income uh, generating issues, so that's a really you know important question. And if anyone knows uh, of more research, thanks. Well, we have time for at least one more question, if not two. And the the queue is currently open, so anybody who um, wants to put forward a question or a comment. You can do that either via the chat or by raising your hand. It doesn't look that way. Well, somebody might chime in, but I'm wondering if there's, okay, here's a question. So Gay asks, is there any discussion within the ILO of changing the tripartite structure? No, although there's critics outside of the ILO and some ex-ILO people um, who uh, you know, think that this is just ridiculous because in fact, the employers don't play anymore. They, they're just obstruction. It's just sort of like, no offense to anyone, the Republican party in uh, Congress. I mean, they, they just try to make sure nothing happens. So that, that's a problem. Uh, the, the one thing to say about this structure is that the, it is the only organization of, as such where workers have a voice and an equal voice to employers. The governments have the most voice and they're also footing the bill. But uh, the, what has changed is the role of NGOs and of the so-called observers. Because prior to actually the, the revision of the Indigenous Workers Convention in the early 80s, I believe, uh, there it was the late 80s, late 80s. Um, there was not um, a real way for most, uh, what we think of NGOs, or most groups that are much more, much closer to the actual workers involved, particularly in informal workers and, and some particular groups of workers to have a say over what was being legislated for their own conditions of labor. But in fact, um, the, the home-based workers and the domestic workers really had a breakthrough uh, by using their relationships with the trade unions to get seats at the table. And that was really important. Okay, well, um, in the last couple of minutes, I wonder if you wanna give us some closing thoughts and maybe an advertisement for your talk on Thursday to tell people what they can expect. Yeah, well, my, my closing thoughts is, this was a great opportunity for me to uh, put together uh, a lot of work I've done over the last, I don't know, 35 years or so, uh, and to sort of uh, think about, for those of you who are just starting out, I mean, there's something amazing when you can draw upon work you once did 
and find it newly interesting and newly relevant. So uh, next um, Thursday, I want to switch not to the people working in their own homes, but what happens when my home is your workplace or your home is my workplace. And so I want to switch the standpoint to that of household workers. And I'll just end with saying with some good news that I'll repeat again, that uh, Governor Newsom on the 27th of September signed the bill we've been working for for, for two years, uh, but not in the form that we wanted to, uh, to begin to end the exclusion of domestic workers from OSHA, Cal OSHA. Uh, and, but the rub was the home is a private place. So he initially rejected our bill. We had to amend it. And, and when we came back this year, cause he still, he was gonna veto it again. Uh, and now we're just going to have voluntary guidelines for home, for occupational health and safety in the home. But we know when you begin with the voluntary, then you push for the mandatory. So that's just this problem of the home workplace. We're gonna be seeing it from a different angle of vision. Both Ex in the US. Well, that sounds excellent. So um, great, we really look forward to that. Uh, again, that's on uh, 12 noon central time, US central time on this Thursday, a couple of days from now. The title is Your Home is My Workplace, The Struggle of Household Workers for Rights and Recognition. We hope you can all join us for that. And uh, thanks once again to Eileen. We look forward to the second installment. And thank you, April, for coming from London. <laughs> all right. Uh, until